Hey guys, welcome to the vlog. It's Sunday afternoon. So, yeah, what I'm going to cover, I'm going to cover a bunch of topics today. This is more of a rambling type of situation. Tech and entrepreneur related, of course. I've been vlogging much less this week because I was very sick. So I was just doing the bare minimum and just resting as much as I can. That's the thing about being a tech entrepreneur. If you're the head of the company, freedom is the last thing you have in terms of time. Now, when you become more established and the business is running smooth and you're not doing anything new, yes, you could coast a little bit. The danger with coasting is you tend to coast on a slow slope down. So in the high tech space, a lot of money can be made very quickly on all levels of business, but you could also drop off uh, slowly if you're not continuously, continuously innovating. So with the high profitability of a tech company, you see with the big boys like the Facebook and Apple and Microsoft and so on, you get that high profitability, but they also have this issue of intense competition. Whereas if you go with a more traditional business like a McDonald's or something, restaurant business or real estate owning where you, you uh, rent out real estate, that uh, is much more stable in terms of your earnings typically, but the rate of the return, meaning how quickly you generate profit, how much profit you make in terms of percentage, is far, far lower. That's because it's a more established industry. That's why you can make big money as a tech entrepreneur, but if you go into real estate and do the real estate game, the process is so much slower because as I said, as I said, just as I just said, as the industry becomes more mature, the margins, the profitability drops quite a bit. So the typical tech company can make 30% margins on their products or more, whereas uh, other businesses at the end of the day, uh, their profitability may be 10%, 5%. If you're in commodities-based businesses, it could be much lower than that. I remember one of the uh, guys I used to do business with 20 years ago, he had a company, a $50 million per annum company, and they sold chicken products, chickens. And he told me the margins were 3 to 5%, depending on the year, 3 to 5%. So they had to run a really tight operation. So, yeah, anyway, just a little tech business tip there. Anyhow, so what happened last night, Saturday night, I was uh, resting up and I started getting in a tech support request. Something was happening with the Studio Web SaaS software, training software. And I monitor these things because I like to be on the front lines. I want to know what's going on, even though I have support uh, partners with me. I'll get into that in a second. Anyway, long story short, what had happened is one of the cloud service providers had made some underlying changes to their infrastructure. And as a result of these changes, it started messing with the, uh, the city web application. Um, session wasn't being held. So what is a session? This is a bit of a nerd talk here. So anybody, if you're trained properly in the web, in the web stack, you know that the web by default is stateless. Meaning when somebody loads a web page, whether it be a dynamic page like from Facebook or from Instagram or whatever, or, or any type of web page, it basically loses connection with the server. The server gets a request, hey, load up this page for me. The server goes, okay, and it sends the page, which is a bunch of HTML code, CSS code, JavaScript code, and then it cuts off the connection. So now the server doesn't know if you're still looking at that page or not. And the reason the web was designed that way is that it allowed it to scale much more easily, much more quickly. Because if the server had to maintain a connection with the client, in this case, the web browser, client-server interaction, I've talked about that in my beginner's courses, if the server would have to maintain connections with the clients all the time, it would be very, very, very expensive in terms of resources, RAM, CPU, memory, etc., you would need much more powerful servers to manage uh, X amount of people visiting your websites or your web apps. So that's why the web is designed that way. So to get around that, they came up with this concept of a session. They, you know, go in for a massage session, you go for a yoga session, you know, that kind of session. Uh, so this is a service session. So what they do, 
is uh, frameworks like uh, ASP.NET, uh, Django, uh, PHP, well, that's a language, et cetera, et cetera. They uh, provide a mechanisms where you can have the uh, web server app that you write, it can automatically tag uh, a person's web browser with something called a cookie, which is a small text file. So that next time the guy visits the site, can click on another button or for some or et cetera, the server will check to see, oh, this is this guy. Okay, we, he, he was visiting just two seconds ago or <clears throat> five minutes ago. So using the session mechanism, they get around the fact that by default, the web is stateless in nature. It does not maintain state. I think of state as a state of being. Basically, it doesn't track. It allows you to track who's visiting your site. That's pretty much it. So anyway, that long nerd discussion about the stateless nature of the web, coming back to my story, they did something, the cloud service provider, they did something to interrupt the app's ability to track session. So things weren't hooking up, started, started getting complaints. Anyhow, so being the owner, I am the first line. So I uh, checked into it. I had to do some investigation. 15 minutes later, I realized, okay, it's gotta be something on the, on the server. Now we hadn't updated that code, that installation for months, so it wasn't us. So I emailed the cloud service provider and I haven't gotten a response, but all of a sudden, Within about a half an hour or so, it started working again. So this can happen on a Saturday night. That's the life of the entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs, once you establish yourself, have tremendous freedom. Like I can work when I want, I can take off when I want, I can work in California, Florida, Asia, I can do whatever I want in that regard. And so I have a lot of freedom in that regard. But I also have the issue where if stuff hits the fan, the app starts messing up, I'm on the front line because it's still a small business overall. A small business, anything under 50 million a year in uh, sales. So that's the downside to that lifestyle. But to me, it's kind of a game. Uh, it's still a game for me, you know, and tracking down errors and stuff. We had something a few months ago where it kept upping the server power because having more and more people join the system, more and more schools, more and more private, it's mostly the schools though. And the server is tanking, I was spending a lot of money on my server, on my uh, hosting, cloud hosting. In fact, I had like, uh, at what point, what was it? At 32 gigs of RAM, 12 CPUs, it was like a massive uh, allocation of resources, it was costing uh, many, many thousands of dollars uh, a year to keep the server at this power. And I said, this is crazy. This is crazy, we have to fix something. There's gotta be something done. And, and what happened, even we were maxing out the server at huge cost, um, it was still starting to slow down terribly when we have uh, too many schools come on. They all come on at the same time. That's the nature of the web apps, by the way. It's always like, yeah, and no problems, and it's the peak. And that's what you have to design for. When you're writing your code, you're choosing your server architecture, you have to design for peaks. Now, in the beginning, you don't worry about that so much because you don't know what's going to happen, if it's going to work. But when you start because designing for peak usage time, and that could be just an hour a day, and then the rest of the day is fine. But if that hour a day when you have your peak users and it's not working, the system's in big trouble. So anyhow, so we had that issue exactly. We're about three hours a day, peak usage, peak usage was tanking the server. And I was putting, like, we had huge resources. I said, there's got to be something going on here. There's got to be something going on. So again, bing, bing, boom, bang, 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 did my investigation. I found out that uh, the previous lead developer hadn't properly indexed some key uh, fields in some key tables. It's, it's crazy. I'll get it. I've, got, I've talked about database indexing. It's how important that is in a previous video. So anyway, three hours of investigation, I decided to take, get into it, boom, boom, bang, I figured it out, index a couple of tables, literally to fix it, this problem, it took me literally, once I figured it out, what was the problem was, if you have to isolate things, it literally took me uh, a minute to fix it. All of a sudden, uh, I was able to uh, reduce my server cost by 95%, just about 95%, and it still runs super fast, again, because of a simple thing. 
I was sitting at lunch earlier this week with uh, a friend of mine who's a CTO of a company that they've raised millions of dollars and they have a SaaS, in, an educational SaaS. And he used to work for me, a mentee of mine. And we were talking about that and I was telling him, you know, it's been, I've been in this game for 23 years and you see these new technologies emerge, Node and uh, this framework and that JavaScript framework or uh, this new server side language or this new programming language. But at the end of the day, still after all of these years, 23 years for me, the same basic problems we had back then are pretty much the same basic problems we have today. Most apps are just UIs, user interfaces, sending and receiving data from a database. That is most of the work. Now, there are exceptions with games and stuff like that, but that's really what it comes down to. And so in the situation where I was having problems where Studio Web was, was tanking because I had so, much, so many users on it, the problem was not the infrastructure and the code, uh, it wasn't, uh, all these things that you might consider, oh, we gotta move to Node, and that's what we did, in fact. Like, when we first started having problems, we built a series of microservices with a separate app server, and then we would feed data to the old uh, system with the microservices services based architecture, and that helped to a certain extent. But at the end of the day, the, you know, all that work building this whole new uh, API, this whole new microservices services layer, it was, at the end of the day, the real problem was, again, the old problem. It was the database, once again, the database. So when you're looking at app development, you have to, first and foremost, especially doing web apps and so on, and if there's a database behind the scenes, you gotta pay attention to that database because how you interact with that database is, is so important. It's the bottleneck in 90% of apps. Keep that in mind.